for coming to the Yorkshire Film and TV Network. Today we've got Rob Speranza with us, who is talking about um, how to be a producer and why do we need a producer. So I'm going to hand it over to Rob, just so you know as well that we are live streaming the event, uh, as we always do. So if you want to ask a question, just let me get round to you with the microphone, because um, even though you won't hear your voice on the speaker system here, you will be picked up on the live stream. Uh, so yeah, don't be shy, just, just wait for me to come round to you. But uh, yeah, if you want to give me a uh, help, if you'd like to join me in giving Rob a round of applause. Oh, that's nice. Thank you. Cheers. Wow, OK. Oh, thank you, Leanne. Uh, hello, everybody. Good evening. Um, thank you for coming. It's not a very nice night, so I appreciate that it's a nice full room despite it's being horrible with the rain. Um, can you all hear me OK? Because I'm not Mike. I can't hear myself, but I just want to, yeah, all right, so through the windows and all this. So, so we're going to talk about what it's like to be a producer. What is one? Why do you need one? Some of this stuff might be some, somewhat basic for a few of you, but then again, you know, I kind of thought about this as if it was a beginner type conversation and then moving into something that was a little bit deeper as we keep going. So bonus points for telling me what film that is, that this picture from. And who are those actors? Ah, Gene, Gene somebody, Wilder and? Oh, it's actually, nobody in England knows you're a wicked thing, what the? <laughs> cool. Um, yeah, so the producers, and that's him, him, him convincing uh, um, Mr. Bloom, Leopold, the two, oh, God, that's a little bit further down. Okay, you can see that, though, right? Yeah? All right, so who am I first? Um, done a few films nowadays. Uh, I'm Dr. Rob Speranza. Yeah, it's a doctor, but I can't do any surgery on you. It's a, uh, it's a PhD kind of thing at the University of Sheffield. That's why I came here first, to do a master's degree. And it kind of morphed into a PhD after being here for about a year. And that wound up like sort of keeping me in this country. This kind of helps answer your question you asked me before. Um, so but I've been here for 23 years now. Uh, I'm from Brooklyn originally, from New York. And, uh, you know, it's just weird, strange, actually. You know, I'll be the first one to say it. How did I wind up in Sheffield? That happened. Um, about halfway through the PhD, I kind of fell in with a group of people who were making films at the university, uh, they were in like a little film society kind of thing, and they were starting to rebel against it. Film society wouldn't let like, you take the cameras outside of the union. I mean, why do you even, what? That's weird. So, you know, uh, they kind of started to create this little production company. I joined that. It was called Sort of Films Limited. They are still going, and they are making films mostly for the University of Sheffield now, but a lot of different clients. And as a bit of a spin-off out of Sort of Films, um, I created the South Yorkshire Filmmakers Network, my ex-business colleague, Ed, Ed Cartledge. Um, that led to a whole bunch of different opportunities. At this point uh, in my life, I've produced or line produced, and I will tell you the difference of what that means between producer and line producer. Uh, six feature films. One is going into an edit uh, next month. About 16 shorts, but literally hundreds of promos, music videos, short documentaries, you know, films for businesses, that kind of thing, literally hundreds of those uh, that I either produced or directed or edited or, or, or exec, that kind of thing, through my music video competition, which I think I'll mention tonight, two weeks to make it, uh, that, that alone has spawned about 250, 260 music videos over about 10 years, probably even more than that. So, um, you know, lots of awards under my belt, which is, of course, Awesome, you know, lots of nominations and awards. Nothing huge like BAFTAs or Oscars yet, but lots of awards at, you know, mid to, well, low level and mid and some high tier festivals. Uh, I run this thing called the South Yorkshire Filmmakers Network in Sheffield. It's become the largest network of filmmakers outside of London now, uh, which, is, which is awesome. You know, it took about 15 years for that to happen, but hey, you know, any way it can go. Um, I also have a different hat on that I sometimes wear, and that's being a drama programmer. Uh, for the Aesthetica Film Festival in York, and I also am on the grand jury for the Bolton Film Festival, as well as, as programming another short film night in Sheffield called Showroom Shorts. So the nice thing about doing that, having that kind of multiple hats kind of thing, is yes, I can see films and projects with a producer hat on and seeing how they develop and how they, how they evolve, and of course when I deliver them. But I can also see what happens when you're at the end of the project and you're actually delivering it for different platforms, whether it's a festival 
or you know, well, most of them are festivals, or something like Netflix or whatever. I get to see those kinds of things and watch as the films get distributed, or more importantly, when they don't. And uh, so that's, that's a really nice way for me to be able to see the industry with a real nice snapshot. Um, as I say, that now I also run this thing, the Nationwide uh, Two Weeks to Make a Competition, which is now uh, starting to um, franchise into different places. The first one, of course, is in Sheffield and South Yorkshire. Then there's another one that uh, is uh, down in the West Midlands. And there's another one now being birthed by the people that run the Harrogate uh, Film Festival to kind of do a uh, kind of all points north. So I'll just very quickly uh, show you the, uh, the websites that I, I, I added up before. Where are they now? Um, we were on uh, Google. Yeah, there it is. Now I maybe I should just do that, like you mentioned. No, don't want to. Four fingers. My four fingers don't work. Remember, yours do. Oh, I went up that way. Thank you. Um, so it's syfn.org. If you guys uh, want to check that out, it's a... Uh, very useful resource in the region. Uh, of course, we also have Yorkshire Film and TV Network. We hire uh, equipment out. We have events. We have networking events. And the first Monday of every month called Shooters in the Pub in Sheffield. We, we program the showroom shorts uh, short film night uh, over in Sheffield as well. Uh, that's at the showroom. What's really convenient about that is it's directly across the street uh, from the train station. Another one coming up on the 17th of March. It's actually next week, isn't it? Mm -hmm. um, so that's coming up fast. And then... Uh, you know, we as two weeks to make it's on there. We also uh, have been programming this uh, a series of master classes called Directions. Um, I think the last the one that's actually just passed is still on here. Yes, it is. Um, Clara Bleasdale came over from Manchester. She's a casting director. Uh, some of them are free for members. Some of them are not. We have another thing coming up uh, on the 23rd of March, I believe, which CVP. I haven't put it on the website yet, and I will. Um, just got it really kind of okay today. CVP are organizing a northern sort of road show to showcase a few new, uh, brand new cameras. Ben, I think you know about this event, uh, and he's been, he might be sharing it on your, on your group soon. So, you know, keep an eye out for that. It's a free bar, apparently. So all the, all the tickets get booked like in about five minutes. <laughs> um, here's me as a little snapshot here. Um, if you want to see the filmography kind of thing. Um, so it's 21 credits as a producer or a line producer. And uh, you know I've done a couple other things too, like as a, as a production manager or uh, miscellaneous, one credit, there you go. Uh, oh, I'm a, I have a cinematographer credit, that's pretty cool. Um, so there we go, what did I shoot? I don't know. <laughs> um, okay, so let me get out of here again. Yeah, I'd like to, let me do it. <laughs> Thank you. Yay. OK. Um, so let's get into it. And by the way, I want you to feel absolutely at ease and welcome to, uh, to ask questions throughout, OK? I don't want to just talk for half an hour straight or whatever it is. I want to have you guys ask things too. If, don't be offended, if I say to you, I'm going to cover that. If I know that I'm, it's in the presentation, I'm going to cover it, I'll probably just say that. But if it's something that's out of left field that I, I, I haven't put in there, OK, yeah, cool. So first of all, love this guy. Look at him. That's a producer, right? Oh, yeah. He's got the cash. Um, what I like about this is I've just thrown in there, if you simply Google producer and ask the computer for some, decor from, for some directions, you'll get Wikipedia saying, OK, a producer is either employed by a production company or working independently, produces plan and coordinate, sometimes, various aspects of film production, such as selecting the script, Coordinating, writing, directing, and editing, and arranging financing. Okay, that's a really nice, you know, kind of quick, concise definition of what a producer does when they make a film. Google, if you just put it on there, and the thing that comes up in the little byline before you hit all the links, it says that it's a person responsible for the financial and managerial aspects of making a film. That's even nice and more concise. I like that. But the thing that I like the best is the last actual thing that comes up when you look at the Cambridge Dictionary, online dictionary of what a producer is, a company, country, or a person that makes things usually for sale. Now, I'm going to ask you guys this straight away. Why do I like that definition the most for when it comes to saying what a producer is? What do you think? Why do I like that the most? Boom, John. Huh? The most honest. It is honest. That's not the reason why I like it the most, but yeah. <laughs> it is honest. Yeah. Thinking commercially. It is. It's thinking commercially. At the end of the day, people, what, that, that's a good answer. Yours was good too. 
but that's what I was thinking. <laughs> um, I want you all to realize and remember that what you're doing here is you're making a product. I don't want to sound all Marxist about it or whatever, but I am going to say that you are making a product for sale. And there is no point in making that product if you're going to put it onto a DVD or on a file someday and just go, hey, that was lovely, isn't that nice? I'll just put it over there for a while and look at it once in a while when I go in my living room. You're making this film so that other people can see it, you can make money out of it, and people fucking buy it. Is that clear? Right, I'll be nicer now. Let's think of the producer as a business owner. It's a really healthy way to think about the producer as a little bit of a microcosm, okay? Every film's like a miniature business, okay? Each one of them has its own aspects that are very, very similar to running a business. You've got your own accounts, you've got ring-fenced money, you got accounts, you got invoices, you got things coming in and out, you got crew, which are your, your staff. You, you pretty much are running a small business in miniature. So I would like you guys to think about the film as a microcosm of a company with all of its own little parameters. It's a healthy way of thinking about running a business and running a film. You're also, though, which is interesting, especially if you run a production company, you've got a slate where you've got multiple products that you're creating as different facets and you know, products within that business, which will help to anchor and buoy that business and create a nice, hopefully, steady income and a healthy bottom line. You're creating products like any business would. But the other thing to recognize, and this is really important when you're actually going to start calling yourself a producer, that you have to own that project and realize that you're the boss. The buck stops with you, and that's your job. You've taken on that role, you've taken on that project, and you understand that you are the boss, and it is going to stop with you. And sometimes a lot of people aren't able to own that, and they have a little bit of trouble, you know, kind of being able to do it. You also have to, you know, there's an old expression, paying the cost, there's a blues song. Paying the cost to be the boss, absolutely, you're going to pay that cost. You're not necessarily going to get the glory either. But the buck does stop with you. So one of the things that uh, this talk was billed as was to talk a little bit more about what a producer does. And a lot of people sort of do have a little bit of a mystification about that. So I want to demystify that a little bit if people are not sure. Can, can some of you tell me? Let's have an honest appraisal here. Um, how many people don't really know what a producer does in, in, in black and white? I still don't. <laughs> you? Just one. Really, so you're not being honest. Come on, people. Don't be like that. One, two, three, four, five, six. See? As soon as I threaten them a little bit. It comes out. Um, OK, good. So there's a lot of things that we do. Some people do certain aspects of these things better than others. But what you're going to do the most, first thing that people think about is you're the money. You're going to raise money or support. But that's not all, OK? That you should not think of a producer as the person that's going to save your ass and get all the cash in the bank account. That's not necessarily the only thing that we do. Obviously, it's a big part of it, and the reason why people bring on a producer is to try and do that, and the producer will come on board the project because they think it's viable and they can raise the money for it. If they don't, they shouldn't be your producer. We will also look into certain practical arrangements. Now, I'm not saying that we do all of that because we hire other people also, like production managers, line producers, and uh, production coordinators and people like that to do a whole bunch of practical things. But sometimes when the project is very low budget and there's only a few people on that crew or on the team, they will probably be also the people that are arranging practical uh, things. But we are also there to guide the project. And when I say guide, I mean steer it from development in the script right through to its placement on a screen somewhere. Okay. You are the person that is shaping the entire project and taking it to where it needs to go in the market. Yes? So do you mean like um, they'll actually decide on um, the script itself? Yes. Yeah. You're not going to take on the project until you know that you're happy with that story so and that script. To the script. You might. I have almost every time. Really? No one's ever sent me a script that I haven't touched. 
in some manner. Yeah, yeah it's always, it winds up, I mean, this, I'm going to get into this a little bit later in terms of what kind of producers there are. I would label myself and people would label me as more of a creative producer. I have an English literature PhD. You think I'm not going to touch something? I'm going to fucking do it. Can I just go over that question again, just for the live stream? Oh, yeah, yeah, probably yeah. didn't hear. So you're wondering whether the producer touches the script from the beginning? Yeah. yeah, that's right. Do they modify the script? Right. Not every producer does. Okay. Some people will just grab that thing and say, right, it's great as it is. We're going to for forge ahead. I might get a script editor to start helping, you know, and that's probably what I would do as well. But in terms of things, if I see something in a story that's like, okay, this isn't working here. You know, this is brilliant. I love this. It's a kernel of an idea but we have to change this, change that. What happened to that character? They disappear on page 60. We spent 30 pages developing her, now she's disappeared, what the fuck? You know, so stuff like that is gonna definitely come into my wheelhouse. But I'm more of a creative producer because of my background, rather than just, let's say, a practical or financial producer. I've worked with both, as a line producer and other people, where, you know, they are very hands-off people, they're just doing contracts, they're just doing practical stuff, they're not touching anything to do with the story, and then leave that to the writer and the director, you know. So there are different kinds. I'm telling you what I do, okay? And there's a lot of people that are, you know, just like me. Most of the other producers that I know that I work closely with do exactly the same thing as I do because they happen to have that same experience and background. Okay, good question. Um, but yes, guiding the entire project. So this is what I mean from script to screen, guys. You know, we will, we will be doing that. And we're not going to abandon you after the shoot, not going to abandon you after post-production. If you sign up to be a producer, you're really in it for the long haul. And <laughs> to be honest, when the, when the film is shot and when it's finished being edited, to be fair, your job's only just begun. Because now you've got to sell that thing and get it out there and get it in front of lots of people and make your goddamn money. And if you're not doing that, well, you're not really producing it. You know, you made the film, but if nobody sees it, I'm sorry, it's not good enough. Is that a scratch of the head or, okay, so don't do that, I watch these things. <laughs> right, managing all staff. Another thing that we do, yeah, okay, I can have other people to come on board and help with this aspect of things, but again, if it's proper low budget and not a lot of people, you're going to also be, you know, managing those people, managing people. Um, I said already, this one, delivering project screen, and then selling the project distribution. Now, I put a, um, a quote up here from Christine Vetcher. Anybody know who she is? New York-based producer, but that's just a coincidence. Christine, no, from Killer Films. Um, she's done Todd Haynes' films and people like that, lots of independent stuff over the years, lots of awards and all that. It's not news that this is a super tough business filled with stress, rejection, challenges, being told no, being taken for granted, yeah, big time, failing, being asked to give back your fee, no, fuck that. <laughs> but if you like us, You'd never think about doing anything else because, really, it's the best job in the world. And I remember when I read that for the first time, I was like, uh, no. <laughs> Is it the best job in the world? But actually, yeah, you know, I, I've really grown to, to, to feel that way. It is an awesome job. It just depends on how much you own it and buy into it. So the other thing that was on the byline of this talk on your Facebook adverts and whatnot was why do you actually need us people, producer people? Why do, we, why do you need us? So I just really did a little bit of a brain dump <laughs> when answering this question and then whittled it down to these two paragraphs because before it wouldn't have fit on the slide. <laughs> why do you need producer? Okay, so um, we're people whose mission it is, that's a key word, to deliver a director's vision to the screen. They might be the ones who initially hired that very director because they believe in that particular vision. I've had that a few times. So don't think all of a sudden, how many directors do I have in the room? All right, don't think that we're your, your monkey boys. We're not here just to do your bidding. But we've brought you on this project or you've approached us to be on this project because you believe that we can work together. And then I, when I take you on or not, will be the judge of that, if that's going to happen or not. So I will then take that project, take your vision and say, I believe in this, in this particular way, to bring it to the screen and make it, for, make it as, be all that it can be. So, the, so then obviously what I'm going to do is then make sure that everything's in place that's necessary to actually make that vision a reality. Yeah. So suddenly I have now taken that on board and made that you know, my, my purpose 
in life for the next however long I'm going to be working on your film. And I'm only going to do that with something that I'm going to feel is really viable. Now I'm going to get into more of the skills that you need and some of the aspects that you might need to embody to be able to, to do this. Second paragraph whittled down from the brain dump was once a producer is on board, a writer-director is now able, of course, to concentrate on the creative aspects of the project and not worry about the money or where people are going to park or what they're going to eat and stuff like that. You know, especially on lower budget things that have a small crew. Now, let's be honest, uh, that doesn't always happen. Sometimes you can't do that, you can't afford it. But I'll give you a little example of something that I've just worked on uh, in January. I directed a commercial. Now, I don't usually direct, but I got approached by this one. I was like, why not? It's for an insulation company. And they asked me if I could make insulation funny. You fucking do it. I like to see you. <laughs> but I'll tell you what, it was a challenge. I wrote the script, a little four page thing, and actors doing weird things like, as soon as I went to the website about the product and I saw that you have to butt joint, you have to butt joint the insulation to each other, I was like, that's comedy gold right here. <laughs> so, but what I quickly realized is, uh, hmm. usually, you know, I'm taking care of all the practical stuff, I'm managing the budget, managing my crew, hiring the right people, getting the equipment, all that stuff. And on this, I decided to do everything. I'm going to direct it, but I'm also going to produce it. I don't really want to bring another person on board to do this. The budget's not that high. I'd rather retain some of the fee, the budget for the project, and keep some of that stuff you know, under control. Plus, it's January. It's quiet. There's not a lot of stuff going on. Why not? Yeah, well, I very quickly kind of regretted some of those decisions because suddenly I realized how much I fucking do. <laughs> and I do so much of this stuff all the time. So much, you know, so much work with the product. And, and I'm trying to concentrate on meeting my actors, doing some rehearsals, getting them the lines. No, 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 you don't say it like that. I want you to be frantic. You know, even in the, in the rehearsals, I, that same time I'm doing this stuff, but I'm also worried about how much that's gonna cost me and then I'm worried about this and I'm worried about that. Not a good idea to try to do both things. If you can afford it, if you can arrange it, it's good to sometimes be able to just pass all that stuff, the practical things, the financial things, the money things, off to the director, especially about two, three weeks before you're gonna hit a shoot, and forget about it, and then you just wanna concentrate on, on, your, on your vision, on the director's vision. Yes, you're gonna speak to the producer multiple times a day if you're not in the office with them, which I like to do. If I can, you know, but you're going to wind up, you know, probably trying to do too much if you're producing and directing, and some aspect is going to suffer, whether that's the quality of production, or the quality of practical arrangements, or unfortunately sometimes, you know, the actual direction. I mean, you're going to be super tired. You're trying to do everything at once and spending ridiculous, you know, long hours. It's, it's not fun. So that's what I would I would say. The YBS project. That's the name of the installation company. Um, you know, it was a really good example of that, and it just happened to me literally, you know, a few weeks ago. Let me just pause for a second before I get into our skills. Do we have any questions or anything people would like to ask at this point? Okay, all right, go for it, yeah? Are we going to do the mic? Yeah, cool. I'm give me a chance to have another drink. Um, I was just wondering, you said that you're a creative producer. Um, oh is there like a line between being a creative producer and just doing a more creative role at writing or directing? Like, why did you decide producing instead of writing or directing? I, I, I don't think I'm a natural born writer. Yeah, I wrote a PhD, it was 300 pages, so what am I talking about? <laughs> but I don't think I have the same kind of flair for character development that other people do. I think there are other people that are better at that than I am. Much better. And in terms of directing, well, it's not what I first did. You know, the first thing, for the first time I ever worked on any film, I was in production. I was either an assistant or a runner. I was doing practical stuff. And I had a real flair for it. Plus, I can talk to people and convince them to do things that they might not want to do. <laughs> so I thought, all right, let's see if, uh, let's see if that works. And, uh, and that just kind of was a natural progression for me. Um, also, I was through the kind of Screen Yorkshire world uh, back when they were part of the UK Film Council. My education and schooling in production was being matched with a few different directors who were likely to be funded by, by, by Screen Yorkshire back in the day when they were doing this. And they had scripts that were getting through to different stages and stuff. And I was like, you know what? This is great. I can, I can find people who I think have some promise 
and, you know, and say, all right, let me, let me have a look at this project. Let me have a look at what you want to do. And it kind of worked out that way. You know, I kind of steered myself into producing that way. But I always retained a little bit of, a little bit of an element of, of creative development for these projects. Just, again, because of the PhD background. And I've just, my entire life, I've loved stories and scripts and movies and music and you name it, anything that's a little bit aesthetic has always been my wheelhouse, always been my thing. So that's why, really. I hope that answers you yeah, without you. being airy-fairy. All right. Um, yeah. Okay, so this is one slide whittled down from 33. <laughs> I do a producer talk called The 25 Skills That You Need to Be a Producer. I've been doing that talk for a few years now. I've done it for the BFI, for Creative England, for various universities and other creative organizations across the country. Um, I'm doing it again at the end of this month at the Kino Film Festival in Manchester. So if you'd like to come to that and really get a full flavored, massive measure of what you need to do to be a producer, you've got to be great at 15 of those skills. Okay and passable at five of them. And for the five that you're rubbish at, you will get other people to pick up the slack. And I will go through all those skills at the Kino Film Festival. I think it's the yeah, 25th. Uh, that doesn't sound right. I think it's the 27th, actually. I'm sorry. But check out the Kino website uh, on, on, on their website. It's already on there. And check it out. I'm not sure how much it is. I'm sorry. I don't know. I just know what my fee is. <laughs> but check it out and, and go if you want. Um, it would be great to see some of you there uh, in Manchester. But what I will do is outline some of the ones that are in there. And you can look at these as a little bit of a snapshot and say, okay, I've got some of those and some of those I don't. And this doesn't mean that I have all these either. On some of these skills, I have to find people that will help me pick up the slack, particularly, you know, even with things I haven't done for a few years. So first I put negotiation skills. Always jumps out at me because seriously, if you're going to want to be a producer and you don't have these skills, you shouldn't call yourself a producer because at the end of the day, you are producing, you are creating, you're making things happen. And for the budget that you've got, you're going to have to negotiate with people that have other purse strings and other facilities at their disposal that you need. So you're going to have to sometimes, almost every day, probably multiple times a day, negotiate with those people to be able to get those things in place that you need for your film to be delivered. Okay? To make it happen. So negotiation is a big one. To be a little bit savvy with numbers, savvy with finance. How many people here are good with numbers, good with, good with money? Okay, all right. Not everybody, right? Put your hands down. Now be honest, how many people here shit with money? Okay, that's all right. It doesn't mean that you can't be a producer, but it does mean that you should get other people to come on board and help you, okay? To become better finance people, to have better sort of management with money. Line producers, which is something that I also do so that you can actually, you know, kind of control your budget a little bit better with a little bit more alacrity. Uh, organization should go without saying, but uh, it's sometimes amazing how many people don't realize that. And when I say organization, I mean, it's on everybody's CV, right? On everybody. How many people have that word on their CV? Organized. Yeah, right. Take it off. We know that shit already. Okay? Great. Wonderful. Um, how many people here are good communicators? Good communicators, if you're, who's a bad communicator? Okay, you gotta work on that shit, all right? Because <laughs> if you're not a good communicator, you know, working on a film as a producer is gonna really, is gonna get in your way, unless you have other people that can really, really st uh, step it up. Now, I, I'm, always, I'm always full of stories, and I gotta keep an eye on the time here, but I will never forget one feature film that I worked on where I had a producer who was just not good with people. And I will never forget that I was stressing out over every little 50 quid, 25 quid here and there. Shit, a focus pull is coming from, coming from Manchester and I'm in North Yorkshire. That's a, uh, all right, maybe we should put them up. No, it's cheaper for them to drive with a small car. I would be worrying about stuff like that. And I had indicative figures of how much we were going to be paying our cast. And I remember that then the producer came to me a few days after I had really done the first proper budget breakdown of this film and got it to a figure that we were all happy with. And she said, oh yes, today's the day that I spoke to all the actor's agents. 
I was like, you haven't done this yet? No, no, I have, but you know, I had an idea of how much they were going to get paid. Okay. Well, what are you saying to me? Well, it's a little different now, but let's just go through it. I'm going to have a meeting. Okay. Have the meeting. Thousands. Thousands of pounds higher. That was her negotiation. And I was like, what the hell are you doing to me? I've been stressing about petrol. <laughs> You're telling me she needs to act in these two and a half grand more? To fuck you. <laughs> Let me give a call to a goddamn agent and tell him what's for. I didn't do anything. I couldn't do it. It was already made. The deal was made. But she just, I found out later that she basically systematically pissed off every actor's agent. So they just gave him the highest fee. That's her fee. That's her day rate. Yeah, she shouldn't be a producer. So, so it's like, whoa. Yeah, uh, don't do that. Um, being a resourceful problem solver is a big one. You're going to be putting out fires constantly. This is what you do, especially if you're on the set. You're going to be working to solve those problems straight away. My favorite example of this just happened a few months ago. Uh, I'm on my way to a set. We're in a theater um, location. Uh, I'm on my way there. Uh, the focus puller who is driving the van uh, with all the equipment in it says, yeah, uh, I got a problem. We've broken down. Okay. There's nothing I can do. I've tried all kinds of things. I tried jumping. It's not the battery. I don't know what's wrong. It's a rental, you know, from a reputable company. Nope. Couldn't get it started. So I arrive on set. I'm like, right, I'll get back to you in a few minutes. Don't worry. I immediately talk to my production manager and they say to me, right, so what we'll do is we'll call the company up and we'll get another van and we'll this and then I'm like, okay, the higher company's in Leeds. You know, that's, this is in Sheffield right now. I don't, no, I don't, I, wait, hang on. That's going to take a long time. So well, what would you do? I said, we have our runners here. Let's get all the runners to our van. Take all the equipment out of the van that we need for the first shoot, for the first actual couple setups. Get that equipment into that, into the few cars, three, four cars, and then in the meantime, we'll get the hire company on to also be sending a van over to us so that we're not just waiting for the fucking company. We actually are able to get the equipment that we need. So talk to my DOP, get a list of what we need. Focus pool is driving the van. He's going to know exactly what everything is. We were shooting in a half an hour. That is being a resource of the problem solver, not just looking at something and saying, okay, I'm just going to have to be a slave to the fact that the van's engine died. And I got refund. Because believe me, I'm on the phone and that's something that I'm fucking fierce. But in a good way. <laughs> uh, another skill, being a good judge of story, being able to detect originality, something that hasn't been done before, that kind of thing. Creativity, as I say, to go along with what we were talking about before, is always a good aspect. Someone who's just financial or just practical, sometimes that's not always the best thing to do. Um, a degree of showmanship, something that I never used to be any good at at all, but has really kind of helped uh, emerge over the last few years. You got to be a little bit of a performer, especially when you're pitching something or, again, when you're trying to convince people to do things that they might not necessarily want to do straight away. Being able to, to be a little bit of a showman and perform something a little bit for someone to show that you can get behind this and you've got passion for it, that passion can be infectious. That passion can be like a virus. You should be able to own that and pass it on to other people so that halfway through your conversation or maybe even within the first 10 seconds, they've already bought in. A good pitcher goes hand in hand with this. Lots of people management, lots of staff to deal with, and handling egos as my picture. Especially when you're first doing things and doing low budget stuff in the beginning of your career, you'll find that this is what you're doing the most. You're just trying to handle people. You're just trying to talk to them. You're trying to get them to goddamn get along, for Christ's sake, in a small room, you know, all crammed together with a bunch of equipment and people trying to do all different things at once. You might find that these things start to emerge and you're going to need to be the person that steps in to quell the disaster. How many people have been in that situation before the Naharians are already going up? See, they do respond <laughs> when something is actually palpable. Thank you very much. Yeah, it happens, right? I mean, it's not, right? It's, it's not fun. But you know what? It's a big part of the job, and you could just got to let that be the water off a duck's back, let it go off you, and not, you don't take it home at night. I tell you what, when I first started working in this industry, it, it came home with me at night, right? And nobody was happy in my house as a result. But 
you gotta just let that go. Let it just, just, just roll off and you leave work at work. My favorite expression for when it comes to that aspect of film production is that you're basically putting out fires. And I almost chose, instead of this dude here, holding off the angry people, uh, was, was getting you know, a little gif of people putting out fires. <laughs> but I didn't. Yeah. Uh, no, no you did. Sitting, See, you're doing yeah. the easy way you did. <laughs> right. It's all right. Um, but don't forget that in spite of all these rather intimidating and fairly non-creative things that I'm putting on this paragraph, that you're first and foremost a storyteller. You, yes, are not the director. Of course not. You're not the writer. Well, you might be. But you're helping to get this story told. You're helping to get this story delivered to an audience. And you're helping to shape how it's going to be conveyed. You are the person who's more of an architect behind the entire project. And that storytelling aspect of producing is an incredibly important one to try to retain. Now, another thing that I was uh, given as a potential question uh, was let's talk about the differentiation between kinds of producers, types of producers, people uh, that get these credits on your film, and a lot of people don't know what the difference is, and I'll just do it in a real nutshell, okay, not exhaustive, because we can be spending all night just on this one slide alone. Um, so we've already talked a little bit about creative versus practical producers. Uh, so I won't really necessarily go through that again, but yeah, that's, that's one aspect of the same person being called a producer. They're not necessarily going to be billed or credited as a creative producer, but you know, they're just different kinds of just producers. Executive producers usually don't have much creative input and usually don't have much in the ways of uh, anything practical to do on the project. They're usually just people that put up the money, and as a result of putting up that money, they get a substantial executive producer credit. Sometimes they also might be people that have a hand in running the production company that is also behind the film, okay? And executive producers uh, on independent, most of, the, most of the stuff that I've written, by the way, today reflects uh, experience on independent projects. I'm not necessarily talking about stuff that's being done with, with, with large studios, okay? Because sometimes then, you know, your, your breakdown of how things work will be a little bit different because you've got studio heads and other execs that get their, uh, their hands in projects like this and you know, things shift a little bit. But executive producers are people that pretty much will just put up the money and then sometimes just leave you to it. Sometimes they'll want to be there. Sometimes they'll want to be more involved. Sometimes they just want to hang out on the set for a few days or entertain uh, the investors that come on board, other investors and that kind of thing. But most of the time, you know, they're the bucks and you, uh, you know, you're there to sometimes you know, handle what it is that they ask for. But as a producer, you're usually you know, working with their money and then developing the project because they trust you to do it. Now, line producers, uh, a lot of experience line producing uh, me. Um, I like to say this about line producing. And the easiest way to think about what a line producer really does is that, yes, you may have been the person as a producer that raised the money. You hire a line producer to show you the best way to spend it. And that can be very creative as well. Okay. So you're taking a line producer on board so that they can show you the most creative, the most efficient, the most uh, ergonomic even, you know, ways to spend the limited money that you have, okay? Or even lots of money that you have. And I've budgeted projects and I've line produced projects that had budgets of, you know, five grand, two grand, way up to two and a half million. And that's what I've done when it comes to managing the budget. That's my experience in terms of line producing and handling budgets. Actually, I did another one that had more of about a five million pound budget one time too, I forgot about that. Associate producers are not necessarily people that have anything to do with the actual film. They may just be people that have led you to money. So if they lead you to an investor and they've done an introduction of some kind, you could give them an associate producer credit. Hey, you know, you're doing that project about dementia. I know somebody who's got a lot of passion for that and he's worth millions. Why don't you go and talk to them? They might want to get behind your project. So they should get an associate producer credit. Assistant producers are literally what that says on the tin. They are literally an assistant to the producer. Whatever the producer is doing or the line producer, they will help. 
I've got 60 contracts to write today. Here's the template. Can you do 30 of them and I'll do 30 of them? There's the template, just fill in the gaps with the name and the role and the fee. Refer to the budget, thank you very much. That assistant producer can then do that, but they don't have to necessarily create anything themselves. They could, depends on their experience. But that's what an assistant producer would do, and literally just be an assistant to the producer. And production managers are usually much more practical people. They will be people that handle all of the literally practical, very rarely creative aspects of the film production, hiring crew, taking care of equipment, dealing with some of the practical things. If they have a production coordinator under them, the coordinator will deal with travel and parking and accommodation and all that fun shit that I never like to do <laughs> anymore. And production managers and coordinators have that, have that dirty job to deal with all that kind of stuff. Um, but when it comes to the other things that I put on the previous slide with negotiation and egos and handling, you know, sort of the bigger things, if you will, you know, usually the producer will, will take care of that. Production managers sometimes will also handle equipment. Uh, in my case, uh, well, I, just because of the relationships that I've built up over the years, I usually handle all the equipment hire. And I, you know, because I'm a little bit more equipment savvy than most producers might be, I know if I'm getting a bum deal or not. Because, you know, when you say, how much you want for that map box? Fuck off, I'm sorry. Things like that. And that can really be a very, very big asset. Let's get some questions. Yes. Uh, give me one second. I'll come around. Sure. Yep. Uh, who uh, organizes the location? Select where you'll film. A location manager. Oh. Okay. One of my favorite people. <laughs> They're so hard to find good ones. Richard Knight, who's spoken for your very group that you're sitting in before, is an amazing location manager who happens also to be the head of production at Screen Yorkshire. And he's a good friend of mine. Uh, and he's a big supporter of the Two Weeks to Make It competition, too, by the way. But location managers are worth their weight in gold because they take the onus off of all those people <laughs> that I mentioned before to just deal with the aspects of the location that you have to deal with. And that includes the parking and the permits and the fees and the practical stuff and cleaning up and all that. You know, all those things, they'll take care of all that. And they're the first person on set and the last person to leave. I've got, got one. Questions, one oh, sorry, man. It's yeah. not just the wall anymore. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Uh, I've got two questions actually. The first one is. I mean, you wrote this shit down. I did. Yeah, I do that. Oh, man. Um, first one is uh, when you said the associate producer, they just kind of like link you up to someone and things like that. Do you, do they charge a fee tenderly? Do you, do you pay them for that credit, or is that kind of they might make an introduction and that's their job done? That varies. Sometimes they might have just heard about your project and led you there. And I said, I'm going to give you credit, man. Other yeah. times they might make a, a career out of leading people to money and then saying, I want 10% of finder's fee. Yeah. Fresh that could happen. Post. Yeah. But I mean, I, I've never had that happen to me. Not many associate producers lend me the money. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. <laughs> that does happen. Yeah, go for the next one. Uh, the next question is, how much does these, this producer role differentiate from the TV industry and the film okay. industry? In the TV industry, especially with a line producer, line producers and production managers can sometimes be synonymous. It means exactly the same thing. Whereas in independent film, line producers and production managers have very distinct, different roles. Producers on TV usually work for a studio. They usually work for a company that has commissioned the TV project. So that's why, like for example, right now I've made a couple of, I've made in the last two years, I've made two different TV pilots, both comedies. And I made sure that right away when I knew I was making more of a TV pilot, that I made an agreement with my writer-director saying, if we're going to be selling this to your Channel 4s or your 5s or whoever we're going to be going to, you need to make an agreement with me that I am going to be retained as a producer on the project, even if I get demoted to line producer, because that goddamn company that's going to then put the money behind it and, and produce the film are going to have their own set of people that are more seasoned TV producers. And I don't want to be dropped. So make an agreement with me that I'm part of the package. No worries. OK, any more before we get into where you can find us? Here, hi. No, OK. So where you can find a producer. Um, we are a rare breed. We're, there's not many of us. And I'm going to skip ahead on one of these things. Don't believe everyone who says they're a producer. A lot of people say it, but they're not producers. 
They've never produced anything. One of the first people I ever met in the film industry, I ran a person's name past him to say, should I get involved with this person? And he said, he can't produce his way out of a paper bag. And that stuck with me for a long time. <laughs> uh, people's glamour thing, the idea of their experience or the aspect of glamour versus truth can sometimes be a real factor here. They just want to say that they are a producer. They're not but they like to think it and they put it on their business card. Not necessarily true. But you could find sometimes producers at networking events. When I go to a networking event, for example, a large one like a Creative England, BFI, one of those things, I can, I, there's been a few of them I haven't been able to move. I haven't been able to get past the bar or I've just picked up my drink because of the bloody queue of people that want to talk to me because we're, there's not that many of us that actually have actually produced shit. Um, you've got the Yorkshire Film and TV Network standing right in front of you. You've got the South Yorkshire Filmmakers Network. You've got other Facebook groups where you can find people like that. Uh, don't expect any producer that's registered on it. Like someone tagged me today on an advert for a, for, a, uh, for a film that I've heard about before. And Rob, I think this is you. And I'm like, I don't know. Like, All right. <laughs> Hang on a second. You know. But actually, I know the, the director. And yeah, I, 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 might, I, might, I, might, I might decide about that. I think so. Um, I literally got a call last week from someone that just found my name in the Knowledge Online. How many people are in the Knowledge or know about what it is? You know, the Knowledge is only one of you. Two. Good for you. Two? Two? Good for you guys. The rest of you are three? Yeah. Okay, the rest of you, okay, I won't say I've been cursing already too many times. <laughs> but come on, get on the Knowledge. It is an online directory of crew and facilities in this country. Um, he literally said he was looking at producers and he looked in the north and he liked my last name, Speranza, so he called me. There you go. Motorcycle film. We'll see about that. Um, so you can find people in the knowledge. Uh, you can find people in other online directories. You can find them on Facebook groups. Uh, going to film festivals and film events are great places to find producers because most of the time they're also in a good mood. <laughs> Because it means that their film has just been on the screen and they're seeing, you know, you can see them, they're meeting, they oh, we just have a glass of champagne. Well, it's the next project. I don't know. Okay, great. If they got something else going on, you can hit it up there when they're kind of, you know, in a good place. Um, but, you know, also because the film has actually been, been screening somewhere, uh, it always kind of puts you in a better frame of mind because, hey, all that work and now, you know, this is what I did it for. So we can have screenings, we can get audiences and get people talking about the project. That's very nice. God damn it. Give up. Um, but the other thing to think about here is don't expect just any producer that you approach to immediately want to take on your project, okay? Because it's not everything is what that person might want to do, okay? You have to be cool and patient and not be insulted if a producer says that that's not for them. I particularly say no a lot more than I say yes. I only want to get involved with something that I think I'm really going to love. You're going to live with it for a while, so you better love it. I'm only going to take on something that I feel I'm going to have passion for, because why would I want to do it if I didn't? And I'm only going to take on something that I think I'm going to sell, because I want to make money from all that work, especially now. So, don't be insulted if we say no. And that goes hand in hand with how we decide to, what to take on and what not. So first of all, that's a picture of uh, Berlin, by the way, the Berlin market. Um, first of all, we want to know, we want to, we, we got to know the market. This is our job. This is what the onus is, the onus is on us. We have to know what the market is that we are entering into. If I'm going to be approached with your project, I'm going to need to know what's hot and what's not right now so I can think about whether or not I want to take this project somewhere and sell it and make money for it, or is this just dead in the water or it's been done already. So we have to know the market and think about how your project might fit into it or not. Next question we'll ask ourselves is quickly, who's the audience and think about the demographics. And demographics have become very interesting in the last few years. Let me see how many of you can say this. It used to be something like, used to be something like, yeah, demographic this is uh, people between 18 and 35. 
It's not a demographic anymore. It's far too general. No one will say that. They'll think you're an idiot if you do. What's a current potential demographic that people who fund projects like production companies or distributors might want to identify, or TV commissioning editors? What kind of demographic might they identify? You've got, um, you've got the middle-aged bracket, streaming service bracket, that's the most of 18 to 35 to nowadays, isn't it? Streaming I wasn't necessarily just talking about 18 to 35s, but other samples of what could be a demographic these days. Teenagers. Even still too general. Go for it. Don't like socioeconomic sort of things. You want to keep going. Pick from like poverty backgrounds might want to watch <coughs> poverty related stuff. <laughs> poverty related. It's even talking. <laughs> this film is about poor people, so poor people go and watch it. <laughs> uh, it's the beer talking. Uh, maybe I don't know. Yeah, sort of. That's closer. Come on, give me more. Give me some more. Yeah, go for it. You. That's too general. Fuck sake, now. Come on. <laughs> Yeah. Film enthusiasts, genre enthusiasts. Say again. Film enthusiasts. Even more, even more specific than that, but you're on the right path. So you put your fucking hand up. Minority. <laughs> Minority views. Okay, you guys, you're being too general. I know. Do you? He had his hand up first because I cursed at him. So go for it. People who like current affairs. Okay, that's a good example, yes. Okay. So I watched that documentary on Netflix, The Great Hack. Have you seen it? No. It's all about, you know, Game of John and Let's Go. And I feel like surely data and being really specific about people is everything out of demographic wise. Okay. 14 to 16 year olds who like this and like this and like yeah! this and listen to this. Fuck That's yes. Kind of so specific. That's what I'm talking about. You go to pitch something now, you're going to talk to a production company or distributor, and they'll say, this is a date movie for people between about 14 and 21. It's the kind of movie you'd go to after dinner on a first date. That's a demographic now. This is a movie that people are going to cuddle up to on a Sunday night on Netflix. It's not going to get a cinema release. But that's it. That's your demographic now. Not no 18 to 35 horseshit. Okay? So, when you're putting together your one sheets, your pitching documents, the things that you're using to sell your project. Be specific, think creatively about your demographic. You'll be one step ahead of your commissioning editor or the person that wants to think about parting with their money, okay. It's a nice way of thinking about demographics now. The other thing, of course, that we're gonna think about obviously is the story and the subject and the relevance to the market as it is right now. We're gonna think about originality. I've unfortunately been the bearer of very bad news a couple times when people come to me what they think is an amazing project and I said this sounds just like so-and-so film what film is that it's just IMDB oh shit it's already been done yeah I can think of a film about I can think of a script that someone pitched me one time about somebody who really wanted to make a film about an android who uh, he, the, the owner fell in love with a female android uh, that the owner fell in love with, but unfortunately the, uh, the android's model was somewhat discontinued so he want, and it wasn't working any right anymore, so he went on this quest to find, find a new one. What film is that? It already existed, but he wrote it. It's Melanie Griffith, it's Cherry 2000. I'm like, that's fucking made. And he's like, what movie is that? Well, see, you're a producer, you should know. Even though it's a little tiny film, you should know. Find out first. Like I said before, you need to love it because you're not going to want to live in this world and make a film over all that time and spending all that energy if it wasn't something that you're a little bit passionate about, that you knew that even over that time that your love and passion for it wouldn't fade. So I'm going to throw this question at you now, be honest. How many people here have been in a situation before they thought they loved it, they were into it for a bit, they started working on it over time, and that kind of started to fade away and dwindle. Okay, that's happened to me too. You, two, three, four, yeah, that happens. What do you do? What do you do if that happens? What if you lose your passion for it after you've made the commitment? What do you do? What did you do? I, I, I showed it on You, I say bye.
I showed it to the people that I showed my idea. Yeah. Oh, it was your project. Okay, I'm talking about if you take it on someone else's and you made a promise. Nobody? Who's what? No, no, it's me. I'm going to go around. Okay. <laughs> What's wrong with it? Sit down here. I'm not touched it. <laughs> it's still there, Ben. Yeah. I told him the project was too depressing. I just sucked it off. But you're too honest. <laughs> Okay, it was, it was getting you down, affecting your mental health. Well, no, it's more just... That's what I would have said. He hadn't thought about the demographics or the story enough. Okay. So I'd said to him, the title's not punchy enough. Yeah. And then try to help him, but then it just uh, wasn't... It's but you should have been out. on that shit from the get-go. Because if you knew was. the project wasn't punchy <laughs> enough and it was depressing, well, you should have known that before you started entering that zone. Not to criticize, man, but I'm just saying. Yeah. Any more? What happens if you lose your passion? I'll tell you what I do. Finish the fucker anyway and get the hell out. And do as fast as you can. <laughs> Thankfully, it only happened to me once. Um, what hey, what? What if the thing that you lose passion for is the thing that you become most known for? It takes off and... Smiling through gritted teeth. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, you know what? You hated it, and you hated the project, and it didn't go well, but, but then it takes off. Okay, well, you got to grin and bear it and deal with it. But, I mean, I would probably get a counselor or something. Sequels? <laughs> hey, what? Would you do sequels? Oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> Don't know. Um, probably not. The thing that usually would get me to not love it is not often the subject matter. If that ever happens, it might be that I kind of fall out of love with the people who are attached. The director, the writer, you wind up realizing that they're a complete psychopath or diva, I don't know. And I don't often work very well with people like that. So if that started to happen, that might really affect my passion for the project. So that's why I ask myself right from the get-go, who are these people? What have they done? What's their track record? Who are they? Can I have a beer with them and actually enjoy myself? Does the time slip by super quickly? Or do I sit there just looking at the clock every five minutes, wanting to go home? Or is it more like, you know what? These guys are awesome. I have a great time with her or him. I'm, I'm, I, two hours have gone by, I felt like 10 minutes. When that happens, it's usually a good sign. Stick with that. Those people you're going to probably enjoy working with, especially if they have a good idea that you like. So I use that as a good gauge of whether or not I take something on. And the last thing is what? <laughs> I should have actually put that way up there. Can I sell it? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be telling myself that right when I talk about who the audience is and the demographic. Then I know then I know if I can sell it or not, who those people are going to be, and who I can probably sell it to. For example, this is a little bit out of left field, but I've been in the meat market at uh, Sheffield Dockfest twice, selling a project. Uh, one was Leeds-based, and the other one was in Coney Island in New York. And uh, just the people that were involved with that project and the commissioning editors that we were speaking to they all speak this kind of language, and if you are able to also speak that language, you've kind of probably got a 30 to 40 percent head start on the people who are, commission, who are, who are pitching to those people, who are pitching to, pitching to the commissioning editors. Uh, you have a, a, a nice head start in front of those people, and that's going to really be in your favor. It's really going to move you ahead a lot faster. Off the back of that, Rob, yes. um, we've had a question online. I'll go for it. Thomas McGrath. Thomas McGrath. Yeah, and he'd like to know um, what is the key to a successful pitch. Oh, oh different talk. It is a different <laughs> talk, but what's the key to it? Uh, all right, Thomas. All I'll tell you is that uh, if you were hearing the bit of, I said about showmanship and a little bit of energy and a little bit of creativity in your pitch, as well as hitting all the traditional things that you should hit and, and you know, put forward. 
your log lines, your synopsis, your locations, your, your, your desired cast, you know, the way you're going to sell it, the uh, comparables when you see other films that have been similar to yours and you can show how much money they've made or lost. <laughs> All those things should be there. But if you have a little bit of a something, something a little more creative, something in there that's going to make people say, well, that's different. I'm going to remember that. I don't mean you walk in naked. People have done that. doesn't work. <laughs> But just doing something that's a little bit more like, I'm going to play you this song right now and I'm going to tell you why in a minute. You know, something like that. that is, sometimes a little bit of a chutzpah, a little bit of charisma can go a long way when you're pitching something. Uh, I don't know if he's talking right now. Thomas, is that okay? There's a bit of a delay. Lag? So, right, let's um, see what he thinks. All right. but yeah, we'll see what he thinks and All if right. you've answered his question. But Boom. we have got a few questions that we'll pick up at the end. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted just to... Yeah. Give you the mic. Up. Thank you. Um, this might be kind of a bit more holistic, but um, which would you say nowadays is a more lucrative industry to sort of get your, like, to sort of get into? So the Car film mechanic. or the television? <laughs> In this country, <laughs> you make a fortune. <laughs> nice, thank you, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> That's what I was looking for. Uh, but yeah, like the film or the television industry, which would you say today is the more lucrative venture to sort of go forth into? What are you asking me? So, <laughs> so in terms film of or TV? Yeah, film or TV. TV. So, do you prefer? So, in Easy. your sense, do you prefer? Yeah, because people have been saying film is dead for twenty years. It's not dead, but still, mm. TV's you know between the Netflixes and the Amazon Primes and all that shit, they're spending billions. You know, yeah. so people are getting a lot more work on TV stuff yeah. uh, than they are in independent films. Uh, Zero Chill, a Netflix drama, just That's shot cool. in Sheffield the last so few weeks, that. and that was like just a drop in the bucket. You know, so. Yeah. Um, that's the kind of thing I think is, is getting a lot more attention. Unfortunately, I don't really do a lot of work in TV, so I'm a little bit out of the loop on that, but you never know. You know it might pick it up. Um, but I would say, I would say that, um, just as yeah. a, a bit of a knee-jerk you know, answer for you, yeah. um, aware of the fact that we don't have a lot of time. There's a question over here. I'll do that. Thank Boom. You. Um, you said the, I guess the most important thing is, will it make money? Yeah. Uh, but well, if you're thinking about it, in a practical way where you are, again, just creating a product. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What about shorts? Because as far as I'm aware, shorts don't I've really have money much. shorts. But don't, how do don't they make money? It off. How do you make money with shorts? I sell it to a production company and distributors. I sold one short. The first short film I ever made, I sold to CBBC. So don't tell me it can't be done. And I made half my budget back one sale. Okay. <laughs> Give me that mic back. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Yes. Uh, sorry. With the mic. Thomas no McGraw loved his uh, answer, Really good questions before. Way, so <laughs> but it can be done. It's just, it's harder, but it can be done. And, and it depends on how much you want to monetize and how much you just want to get it out there. Hi, yeah. Um, taking you back a slide, it uh, mentioned uh, who's attached to the project. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and it, it named director. Yeah. Um, how much uh, yourself or guys at your level producing? Um, sort of looking for t sort of talent scouting directors um, or would you tend to go more established directors? Uh, these days for me, I'm probably not going to align myself with someone who hasn't got a bit of a track record. When I was first starting, I might align myself with people that didn't have one, they were in the same position, but I thought they had a good story and some promise. Sometimes I was wrong, sometimes I was right. But as I said, I kind of went through the Screen Yorkshire route there, so I did have a little bit of help. Uh, but nowadays, yeah, if it was me, it was gonna, just from a personal point of view, if I'm going to align myself with someone whose film I want to make, you know, that person probably has some experience, they've done things, they probably still have a little, they probably have a little bit of money behind the project already just because of who they are, and they've come to me on, with, a, with a number of assets, either money or cast member, or something that they want to particularly do, or a relationship with a distributor, or something like that. They're gonna to come to me with those things already, and my job, thank God, is gonna wind up being a little bit easier, actually, because now I've kind of done my time in the trenches, and I'm not just starting from scratch, and people will come to me now with things that are a little bit more developed, and they know that they can do it, and I will say, oh, you know what, this is good. I don't, I don't have to you know, bust my ass and do things from scratch anymore. That's just my own personal thing. All right. And off the back of that, Rob, yeah. um, Emily Laura Vale would like to know, if you're starting out as a runner, okay. how do you get to where you are now as a producer? Where, which path did right, you take? Emily. Cool. Uh, it's going to take time, 
and it will be something that you do. But for example, I can think of someone right now who started off as a runner on a film that I did. Come on, Rob. Three years ago. Three years ago, January 2017. February 2017, that's what it was. Yes. And she very quickly moved up the ranks, became someone who is a known producer, director, production manager in this region, just worked her balls off. She didn't have any, but yeah. Um, and and you know, just worked really hard. You know, and and at I remember she told me that at first, the first film she ever worked on with me, which was this film in 2017, she was really scared of me. <laughs> this is a big, loud American guy. I really liked her. I thought, ah, she's, she's got the spark. And within, yeah, three years, she's kind of like my kind of right arm now when I work on things I really need. It's Nicole Pot. I'm not going to be funny about it. And she was great. You know, she's, now I call her up and I'm like, oh, geez, I need this. You know, pick up the slack for me here. What do you think? And um, yeah, in 2017, she was just run, ran. So that took three years, Emily, which I don't think is too bad. Um, work hard. Show tenacity. Don't complain. Don't say that you're available when you're not. And pay attention and hang around the assistant directors because they're the ones that you can kind of hover near and when you're needed they can look around and see you straight away when you're not needed you can hide and not necessarily be in the way so that's a little bit of a hint for being an effective runner which is a different talk as well Brilliant. all right you. hope Emily likes that answer there you go yes this is an AD question, AD question. I'm not one of those yeah, no, no, do, do you it. have the microphone? Oh, no, it's there, sorry. Pass that back to her, please. Would Hello, you, Jenny, by the way. I recognize you. you. Didn't uh, see you the light of my on. eyes before. Oh, we got, we got mic there problems. Go for it, yes. Would you rather have established ADs on your crew? Hell yeah. Okay. <laughs> What's the second part of that? I was going to say, if someone's learning how to be an AD... No. Okay. Not on a project that's got you know the level that I'm going to be doing them now. Okay. When you're first starting out, yeah, of course, yeah. I'm cool. not going to bring on an inexperienced AD. All right, thank you. Until I until they've cut their teeth a few times. Yeah, thank you. Right. Okay, so how do we raise the money? How do we do this? There's no one answer to this question, and there's nothing that yeah, there's no there's just no blanket answer to this. Okay, it's not going to happen. But for example, the projects that I'm, I've been approached, there's two that are potential projects right now. Both of them I know on the radar of public funding type bodies like your Film Hub Norths and your Creative England's BFI, that kind of thing. So knowing your way around a good application form and being able to write good, questions, good answers and stuff like that, that's, that's where this way, it's a skill. A director I worked with a few years ago who's now making TV shows that have got 1.5 million pound budgets per episode. Really good shit. You know, pissed off at him. <laughs> um, you know, he used to tell me, you've got a skill for that, man. You're amazing with those forms. You can just really, you write those answers. They're amazing. I would never be able to think of some of that shit that you say. So being able to be skilled with answering those questions on those application forms can be great. For example, just a couple months ago, I was approached by a social enterprise. There's another hat that I wear as I do a little bit of contract work for Sheffield Live Television, making films and being uh, an enterprise advisor uh, for social enterprises that are looking to try to um, expand their businesses and make themselves a little bit more prominent in the industry. Uh, so I make them little promotional films and stuff. And they came to me and they said, yeah, we want to apply for a South Yorkshire Community Foundation grant but we're completely and utterly perplexed by the online application form. As our enterprise advisor, can you help? I said, ah, let me come over and have a look. And I had a look at some of the stuff they had written. I knew that it was not very good. So I was like, all right, let me have a look. And I advised, I tried to talk to them about it, live kind of computer action right there. She was sitting in front of her computer trying to write what I was saying and just kind of going, eh, eh. <laughs> He's not, not very good at it. I said, you know what, come here. So I typed the fuck out of all kinds of stuff. I said, is this what we're talking about? I kind of had a little bit of an idea of what they were doing. I saw her last Saturday. She goes, we got the funding. Like, of course she did. 
<laughs> but it was good. It's gonna, and that like five or six grand or whatever it is, is gonna make a massive difference to their organization that's trying to help people with mental uh, disabilities, learning disabilities and stuff in a small area of Sheffield. So it's really for a good, very good cause. Um, same kind of token, applying for grants and also looking for in-kind support where you can get it. So I've talked this company into providing all the equipment for free. Brilliant, you've just saved yourself three or four grand on a short film or something like that. You know? So that kind of thing could be a massive way to also raise finance even though it's not actual money. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's money, but it's not money you have to spend. That's how I put it. Crowdfunding is something I've only done once with very limited success. My, my logic in crowdfunding is that it can be worth it, but if you're going to be spending a lot of time and energy trying to raise five or ten pounds from 200 people, and you're going to be spending weeks and weeks on this, maybe you should just go to a couple of high worth people, individuals, and go for, you know, 50, 40 percent of the budget, whatever, you know, per person, rather than getting five or ten pounds in little nip and tuck ways. I find that that is a better use of your energy and effort and time than necessarily doing a massive campaign online where you're spending, you know, just countless hours trying to get a tenor from someone. But it's worked for a lot of people. What I will say is that the more social enterprisey your project is, the more your project is something like helping a blind kid in America afford medical bills to get something corrected. That's the money. You can do that a lot better, but it's rare that you'll see a project that's like just sheerly a creative project have you know, overwhelming success on crowdfunding as much as you will a project like that. Equity finance means private investment. Okay, fancy way of saying that. Private investment going to individuals and raising you know, chunks of money just by attracting separate chunks of investment from those people. Production companies, especially London-based or Manchester-based ones, will sometimes get behind your project and actually fund something with a pot of money that they have set aside to actually produce films. For example, Warp Films, a few years ago in Sheffield, had a subdivision called Warp X, and they were given a chunk of money with which to decide which projects they were going to, 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 to produce with money they had raised from elsewhere. And people could go to them and say, okay, we've got this project now, we'll Warp X produce it. And they, they made five or six features with chunks of money uh, in the 250 grand each kind of range or something like that. Uh, I think Donkey Punch was made with, with Warp X. You remember that film? It was utterly disgusting. Yeah. On the boat. So, yeah, uh, disgusting things happening on that boat. Wow. So, yeah, that, that was an example of, of, a, of the kind of uh, a production company getting behind a project and funding it themselves with money that they've made elsewhere. Um, tax credit in this country is how much right now? Thank you. Uh, it's going to change maybe next week when the budget comes out, but we'll see. Um, tax credit, so we'll see you know, with that, but yeah, 20% right now. So therefore, when someone comes over to you and say, yeah, yeah, I really need a producer. Um, got to raise a little bit more money. I've already got 20%. No, you don't. You're just thinking of the tax credit. I've got 20% of the budget already. Yeah, sure you do. Um, gap finance. There are, there are specific companies or specific organizations that call themselves gap financers. They're similar to banks in a way. And they will cover a certain gap in your budget. So say for example you have a, you have a 750,000 pound budgeted film. You raise 250 grand from a BFI or a Creative England or something like that. You raise another 250 grand from, uh, from like a Film 4 or BBC films kind of thing. That's 500. And then you got a gap finance thing there. And you got some tax credit, which is another 20%. So 20% of, of 750 grand is what? <laughs> what? Thank you. So now I've got up to 650,000 pounds, right, on my project. I need 50 grand. No, I need 100 grand. A, a, a gap financer might be able to cover that hundred, okay? 
and say, all right, well, you've done that, and you can find those people. You have to provide your financial evidence. You have to provide you know, clear evidence that the, the money's going to be there. And you can go to those people and say, okay, great, I got 100 grand that I need. Can you cover it? And they will do that. And you'll, you'll, when I say it's like a bank, they'll have some kind of an interest rate based on how quickly you can pay them back for that 100 grand. And that's how they make their money. Okay. So you might want to do that. Or you might not, and the last thing there is loans, and I will say I hate loans. I'm not going to fucking talk about it. Don't do it. <laughs> but people do do it, yes. Can I just um, Do you use a mixture of, yes. of all of them, or yes. is there any specific method that you choose? I usually use a mixture of a variety of things. Sometimes things are purely equity. Sometimes things are a little bit of equity, a little bit of public, but that's hard to do sometimes. Uh, but there are, yeah, there's all kinds... No film's budget is ever exactly the same. I always have a variety of different ways to find sources of money um, to actually get to the point where I know I need to get to. And that's going to go hand in hand with what I say I do when I work on budgets and schedules. But it's very rare that all the money comes from one particular source and that's all that it comes from. Yep. Yeah? Oh, Boom. Yeah. Have you ever used EIS and SEIS before? Yes, I have. I'm not going to talk about it because I think it might be dead. <laughs> <laughs> so because of this whole deal now with Brexit and whatnot, it feels like the SEIS and EIS schemes might be on their way out. So right now, you have enterprise investment schemes, for those of you who don't know what they are, um, that could indeed cover a fair amount of budget. But what that does, an enterprise investment scheme basically means that a, a, a pool of companies have put money into a scheme with projects that are deemed to be financially viable and they work hand-to-hand -hand with tax credit as well. And now a lot of that money was coming from Europe, so those things might be a little bit bye-bye. <whistles> so I'm not sure about those right now, but I've been told that that looks like it's not you know, going to be the way forward anymore. But we'll see. We'll see how things kind of pan out. You know, I, think, I think there's a few things going on there that might affect it. Don't know EIS and SEIS schemes incredibly well, the last film that I worked on had somebody working on that that was behind the scenes. I didn't really have a lot of, you know, hands in there, really, doing it myself. But it's a lot of paperwork, and you have to obviously, you know, hit a number of different parameters to satisfy conditions and stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. One question. Um, the, you were talking about crowdfunding to better to go to a couple of um, kind of high worth people mm. uh, and try and get like maybe two or three people. No, or what I said was that sometimes it might be more worth going to high net individuals yeah. rather than running a, a crowdfunding campaign is what I said. Is to do that, is that any different to the equity financing? which is No, because those high worth people will then provide equity finance. So it's, it's, yeah, so right. that's similar same thing. thing, same thing, yeah. Right. yeah. Correct. Cool. Okay, right, cool. <laughs> so, in order to figure out how much money you need, oh, I've gone way over. It's eight bloody 20. Um, if everyone's still happy to stick around. <laughs> you guys around, are all right. <laughs> Woo. This is really good stuff. Are you all right, really though? Are you happy, yeah, Rob? Yeah, I, I, I just finished this goddamn thing off. Okay, so budgeting and scheduling. Um, hey, man, you know, if you want to know how much money you need, you're going to have to be savvy with budgeting and scheduling. Right now, I will call myself a veritable expert with movie magic. This is industry software. This is software that's going to really help you a lot and save you time in terms of being able to produce something that you know will cost a certain amount and take a certain amount of time to make. You always start with a schedule first. Why? No. Why do you start with schedule first? Bob Jordan. Why do you start with a schedule first? Sorry, man. Put you on the spot. I knew you were the right guy to ask. Yeah. Because if you don't know how much time you're going to need to spend on actually shooting your film in a realistic way over four days, five days, three weeks, two months, three months, whatever it is, well, how are you going to know how much it's really going to cost to make? When you're paying people day rates or weekly rates or how much prep you need or how many locations you're going to, how much petrol you're going to need to uh, spend money on to get everybody to set, 
right? Break your script down, do your schedule first, include all your post-production, think about visual effects, all that kind of stuff. Do your schedule first, and then you'll know your budget. It is, uh, yeah, industry standard produce, uh, produces software now. One thing that I remember, I went to a, uh, I was on this little scheme that Creative England were running a few years ago. It was called Lining Up. It was really good. It was meant for people that were kind of like doing five-figure, six-figure budgets and working on films like that, but meant to catapult them into more six-figure or seven-figure kind of zones. I was really lucky to get onto the project and onto the program, and we were being mentored, taught one class by a well-known line producer who uh, produced, you know, really big films with, with large budgets like The Man from U.N.C.L.E. and James Bond films and stuff like that. And I was down in Elstree Studios in, a, in the Spielberg suite learning from this guy. And I remember what he said. We, very beginning, very beginning of the seminar, he says, okay, guys, fire up movie magic. Not do you have movie magic. All line producers in the room. An assumption that we all, of course, we did. So this is what I'm saying to you. A lot of people are starting to use Keltex now. I'm aware of that. Pretty good software. Been showing it recently. Thought, no, it's going to give Movie Magic run for its money. But this is still an industry standard. So if you know how to use it, you figure out a way to get your hands on it, great. But if you don't have this project, Keltex is free. I think it's easy to use. Uh, well, easy to use it's, it's, you got, once you learn it. There's not, if you don't have the time or money, to, uh, to, to buy that uh, software and learn it a little bit, you know, get a good line producer who could do it for you. Hello, I'm standing right here. I charge a fee. <laughs> Won't do it for free, but I'm, I'm you know, sometimes surprisingly affordable. In addition to that, understanding how budgets and schedules work and how much time you need to allocate to certain scenes or certain locations or putting things in like unit moves in a day Things like that are absolutely paramount to learning how to do this job and figuring how much something is really going to cost to, to make. So as I say, don't guess. Always schedule first and you budget after. And this is getting close to the end now. Um, organization and communication. We talked about this before. Your CV, the joke I made. Um, I love this, by the way. Listen, Larry, all you seem to do lately is put out fires and run around like a, like a what? Never mind. Yeah, I just found that last night. I thought it was good. Um, but yeah, this is what you're doing, you know, part of your job on set, beyond all the budgeting and the background stuff and the ways you're going to figure out how to raise money, is you're going to be dealing with people. Your business is going to be in people. And a lot of your currency and the way that you handle people is going to be kind of a real, ref it's going to be a reflection of the value of your project. So a big part of doing this is people management. Delegation of roles, telling people what to do, when to do it, how to do it, or sometimes just letting people that are really the professionals do their job, but giving them the parameters they need to work in. One of the things I'm quite good at, and it varies at how much sleep I've had, is seeing a problem before it happens. Spotting where something is going to go wrong before the fire bursts. So you're ready with your extinguisher before the first spark, and you can take care of it before the issue becomes an actual problem. Understanding people's needs and being able to relate to people, understanding what they need and why things are happening the way they are. I had a makeup artist on a project recently without telling me what was really going on seemed to be somewhat unreliable and I read between the lines and figured out what was kind of going on and made allocations to help her out a little bit because I didn't want to just let her go. Let's understand what that person needs, see the problem before it happens, and meet it head on in private and speak about it so that we can make sure that nothing gets affected and all those cogs that start spinning around to make your film actually be produced doesn't suddenly get a little wedge in there or monkey wrench in there, or what do you call it, a spanner, uh, over here to make sure that that doesn't wind up getting in the way. But managing people's personalities, handling egos, all those kinds of things are a big part of your job. If you don't have the stomach for it yourself, get someone in who does because it will happen. And over time, what you'll find is you're going to be building relationships with crew, with facilities, with locations, with all the catering companies, whatever. All different things that are going to be necessary for you to bring your film to the screen and make your crew and cast happy. Even hotels and 
things like that. God, you know, sometimes the relationships that you've built over time can be incredibly valuable to you, especially if those people that are working with you have a good experience. You will also need to manage investors and financers. One of the best days I ever had on a shoot was when I didn't have to worry about anything to do with the film itself, but I had about a team of about eight, eight investors come and visit, and I just took them around to different places. Oh, here's our equipment room. The set's over there today. We've got all the people dressing up in you know, warrior gear in this room. Here's all the equipment stuff. Here's all the costumes. Here's where our AD yells at people. <laughs> it's a lot of fun. And they came, oh, we had a great day. I'm so glad I parted with my five grand. So just managing those people and being entertained a little bit can be a skill in itself. Uh, and then you don't want to forget about the fact that even though film is something that completely and utterly can take over your life, and I don't mean to, I, I won't underestimate that, it really is, it, you know, it can do, I'm sure a number of you feel that way, but you don't want to forget about the fact that you actually also exist outside of film, and you have a life, maybe you have a family, maybe you have wife or girlfriend, your boyfriend, husband, maybe you have, you know, a child, maybe you have interests. You know what those things are, you know, outside of movies? To, tr to strike a balance where you don't just work in film and dedicate every bloody waking moment, and even while you're asleep, to film is important because you're going to burn out if you don't create a life-work balance. I have become better not amazing yet, but better over the last few years at learning when I'm not working. If somebody wants my attention and somebody wants me to do something that has not to do with the film, I recognize the value of that and say, go away, budget thingy. I got other shit to do. And I'm going to strike a better balance between life and work. And that is all done in terms of what I want to tell you. Well, thank you, guys. So I think we have some time for other questions that have emerged, and here we are. All right. Again, sorry, I've got two. First one, just a Bring quick... Bring them down again! Just a quick one. I do, I swear, <laughs> I forget. Uh, first one, would you advise a producer get an agent? Hard to do. Um, don't know many producers that have agents who are not, like, quite sizable, Scott Rudin-type people now. Mm -hmm. uh, if you get to a certain level where you just cannot control your diary anymore. Leanne, you actually suggested to me that I get a PA uh, at Showroom Shorts a few weeks ago, and I thought, that's a great idea, yeah, okay, yeah but I'm not quite there yet. But, um, you know, yeah, if you can, but then you gotta be prepared to get rid of, you know, part with part of your fee. And half the time, the film's over budget, they're gonna ask for your fee back anyway, so probably not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the next question is, um, uh, it's a situation I've got where I've got a potential investor uh -huh. and a lot of money uh -huh. and the an idea that I fully believe in uh -huh. what do what is it the producer's job to take them a business plan where they're going to see what return on investment they're going to yes. get yes or do you is it the producer's job to put that together or do you bring in a kind of business specialist you can do, do if you're not good at it yourself you can get a person that's good at working out exactly that kind of thing you know income and expenditure and working out where the money's going to come from uh, but a good way to indicate how much money your film could make, because let's be honest with you, like William Goldman said, nobody knows anything. How many people have read that book, Adventures in the Screen Trade? Well, then you should be not asking me this question. Dipped in the <laughs> yeah. It's a great book. Read it. Yeah. Uh, nobody knows anything. He says it at the num a number of times throughout the book. You're always speculating. You don't know how much a film's really going to make. You don't know how much people are really going to spend their money to watch your film. So at the end of the day, as long as you've got something that's indicative of how much your film might make based on previous films that were also made in a cave and as a horror film, Dark Water, I don't know, so, you know oh, Dark Water, yeah. what the fuck is it called? <laughs> deep, deep, what's the cave with the women? Descent. Thank you, the descent, yeah. So stuff like that, the cave with the women! <laughs> um, if you can provide some indicative figures to say that, yeah, your film is also set in a cave, might be similar to this, mm -hmm. well, great. Then that film did this in the box office, UK domestic, international total. 
how many screens was it released on. You can find this stuff on Box Office Mojo. You can mm -hmm. find it on IMDb Pro. You can find that information out without spending a fortune. Box Office Mojo is free. Hypothetically, if you were to take the film project to the investor, they would uh, get involved and the film was to flop for whatever reason, yep. ill time or whatever. Yeah, yeah. What sort of, um, like... That's why you have a contract. You. Yeah. you have an agreement. Right. Every contract is different. You work out with them what will happen if indeed that is the case. Usually with almost every situation where you approach an investor, there is a disclaimer in your contract that says there is not a guarantee that you're going to make money. Film is a risky business and things that are a lot more legal than that. But it'll say that as a disclaimer first off. I've got one that I've, I staple right on, I paste right on top of every contract. Amazingly, people still invest. Film is not a safe investment. It's a risky investment. In terms of the rest of the world, stock markets and products and things like that, it's a hell of a lot more sound an investment than film is. Film is risky, but why do people invest in it? It's kind of glitzy. It's kind of cool. You never know what might take off. We might have a paranormal activity on our hands. Yeah. Rob, and we've had quite a few questions online, okay. um, mainly about scripts. Um, I will turn this one off. Um, right. So with, with script writing, for the script writers, how did you get involved as a producer? Like, how did script writers find a producer? Some of the initial uh, scripts I ever saw, again, came this little group of people that I wound up getting involved with who were rebelling against the Filmmaking Society at the University of Sheffield. And I, I, the first short piece I ever saw was from you know, people like that. I also used to write quite a lot of poetry. And people were vying to adapt a few of the poems that I had written. This is back when I was doing my PhD about film and poetry. And they wanted to adapt one of those poems into something that was a bit more narrative. So I, I, would, I would see things like that. That quickly graduated to me being uh, introduced to via networking and sometimes just random pairing uh, with people that were on the Screen Yorkshire schemes that they were running at the time. They didn't do that anymore. Um, you know, developing short film writers, writers, directors, that kind of thing. And I wound up falling into a, a you know, a few people, not falling into, falling into a group of people, like, uh, where I started to just enjoy working on their projects. There was one woman who I made a, a couple films with, uh, who really I was just working with as an AD for a while. And then she came to me one day in the middle of one of the shoots, and said, you know, I'm writing too, actually, and I want to direct something. What do you think about so-and-so? And I was like, well, this is pretty cool. Let's do it. And I, you know, wound up raising money for her um, a little bit. So it happens in a variety of ways is the answer to that question. But, I mean, I think really, if I really boiled all that down to the brass tacks, that all came as a result of networking and just being out there in the world, meeting people and opening my mouth. If you really boiled it down to the brass tacks, that's, that's what you can tell that person. Yeah. And how do you feel about people that... Get, get producers to sign an, an NDA saying, don't talk about this idea, don't yeah, talk about this NDAs. script. Um, I've been asked to sign up an NDA or two, uh, and, and that's fine. If it's something they really want to protect, I don't have any problem with that. Uh, it will limit the amount of people that you can bring on board the project in a free way <laughs> for a while. So how do you do that? You sign an NDA, but then you're asked to raise the money. I can't raise the money. I can't fucking talk about it. What do you do there? So there has to be a certain level of agreement where you can, you can do that and you can sign your NDA, but then if the writer-director needs to come with you every time you have to pitch the damn thing, it could be a real ball, you know, a real ball ache. So ah, you got to judge it, I think. I don't know. I mean, I've done it a couple times. It's not really been too much of a problem, but I can see where stop, stop gaps and problems could be. As a producer, are there any red flags in a script that you look for that, that really jump out and think, nope, I'm not going there? Bad writing. <laughs> <laughs> um, remember what I said before about like um, a character that gets abandoned partway through the script, things like that. I look out for stuff like that, you know. I'll never forget watching Alien 5 just completely abandoned Michelle Rodriguez. She just, like, I don't know what happened to her. She just kind of, uh, she was really important five minutes ago. Where'd she go? She's gone. <laughs> just stuff like that, you know. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, I also think that sometimes it's, um, 
a red flag to me. I, okay, I got an example. Feature film I worked on a few years ago, every scene, and I'm not shitting you on this, every scene ended with a character saying, okay. <laughs> That's how the scene ended. Character goes, okay. We've decided this now. Let's move on to the next scene. And it was a little bit like, I think we need to vary that a little. So, yeah, that's a red flag. <laughs> Don't end your scenes with someone saying, okay, online person question. And, um, another one. I might, yeah, there's a few questions online, but I might just throw it out to the people in yeah. over here and then come back to the online. Okay. Uh, yeah, so I have like two small ones, but like, first one, on the back of that, the red flags, in an opposite sense, what's a sort of significant way you can tell something might actually sell? Although you said no one really knows anything, but what's a tip that you can tell? What I said before about demographics mm. and understanding what's kind of hot in the market right now. Yeah. So you see, for example, right now it seems to me that a lot of people are into getting back into 80s or early 90s style cinematography, Stranger Things. Yeah. As super hot people making films that echo Spielberg and Joe Dante and people like that. I'm just like, this is hot right now, you know? It requires a little bit of a budget, production design. But if you're going for that kind of style, you make films like Super 8, for example, you know, that are really bringing back that world, worlds that we all fell in love with. At least I did. I was like, you know, 12 when Raiders came out, yeah. you know, something like that. That, that is hot right now. So I would look at things like that and say, am I going to be able to very quickly push this into the market because this has got all those hallmarks. Yeah. So that's just an example. So I would say, look at your market, know your market. Again, I've kind of answered it, that question in, in a few different categories. Yeah. Also, um, yeah, this quick thing as well. You, I know you sort of mentioned this again, but you talked about how the difference between like making a project and then like the period after post, actually trying to distribute it. Yeah. That in between section like of when you scenery. begin to produce it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like, how do you sort of get from that point where you finished it to actually seeing it on a screen? Take a rest <laughs> after the shoot is done and the edits, and then you have a little bit of a break. But what I have done on almost all the features that I've sold was around when I was getting to the stages where I was getting into early post production and create a trailer. I can create you know, some elements that I might be able to put forward to people. I just get people on the phone, call up distributors, call up sales agents, and say, yeah, I got another one. Uh, this is this, this is that. What do you think? Made for XYZ budget, shot in the Alexa, shot in the Venice, whatever. You know, and then tell them what's going on. How much the budget, who's the director, he's got this, he does that, he won this at Venice, he won this at Cannes, whatever. And, and then, uh, yeah, you know, it stars so-and-so. They ask me five questions. Basically, distributed sales and ask who's in it, who directed it, how long is it, what'd you shoot it on, what's the budget? If I can give them all satisfactory answers to those questions, let me see the trailer. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, how often do you bring people into the production, as in like, do, do you bring your own crew members with you? Or do you advise people? Oh, they're not in my pocket. No, but yeah. I'm, what I'm asking for is more like, I'm sure somebody would say, oh, we need an editor or an AD. Is it something that you advise on or like? Oh, no, yeah, no, absolutely. Most of the time, if, if I'm a producing, if I'm producing something, a production manager or line producing something, I'm going to go to people who are my trusted crew members and contacts first. Yeah. Once in a while, if they can't do it or whatever, then I'm seeking new people and I'm just really expanding my network of contacts because I'm hiring new people on the project. Uh, but yeah, I mean, most of the time, absolutely, I'll go to the people who I know and trust first. That's what I meant by a uh, slide before that said, you know, uh, creating connections, creating, um, what, what did I, I can't remember the phrase that I've used now, but yeah, building relationships over time. Um, that's certainly something that, as a producer, you should hang on to, foster those relationships, and you know, hopefully those people are doing a great job. So you're going to bring them on over and over. Awesome. And the second question, probably a quick one. Mm. And excuse my French. What's your biggest fuck up? That's French. <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a British saying. I've what's heard. my biggest fuck up? Yeah. Ha. Huh. Okay. Wow, I've never been asked that before. I'm going to have to think about that. 
Okay, no worries. Good question. Yeah, and I'm not going to let it go. I am going to answer <laughs> you, but pass that mic to somebody else while I think. <laughs> Any more yeah. questions? Over there, somebody back there. What's my biggest fuck up? Jesus. <laughs> Personally? <laughs> I can answer the personal ones pretty fast. <laughs> if, it's, if it's for a film, it's going to be harder. Yeah. yeah. Um, what general advice would you give to someone who's, who is looking for a producer? Like, what, like, how can you like, find a producer who's like, a good producer or not a good or a bad producer? So the question is how to find a good producer well, or no, one that suits your project? Well, like, yeah, but someone who's like, who is good, but also someone like, or if there's like someone who you might think is like a red flag and you don't want to bring that person. Track record. In every case, track record. Also, it's not just bad or good producers. We can also extend that question to crew members, other people. Yeah. Someone's approached me, they asked so-and-so X, Y, Z about you know, coming on board their project. I look at their CV, I look at their whatever experience they have. Oh, they've worked with Joe so-and-so. I know Joe so-and-so. I give Joe and so-and-so a call. Find out what that person was like, right? Oh, no. Don't go anywhere near him. Oh, yeah, no, he's brilliant. Awesome to work with. Fantastic. Okay. A little bit of research. Check their track record. Look at their CV. See what's going on. Another qu answer to that question. I'll never forget this. I was approached by a known film person <laughs> around Sheffield, sort of area, build himself as a director. Um, someone who was, you know, kind of talking to me about wanting to take on his short film, a nice way to open up the doors for him. He's only done low-budget stuff before, music videos or promos, and he wanted to do something that was more of a narrative drama short film. But I, you know, I, I haven't really done that before, and I need a good producer to put that kind of stuff together with actors and locations and crew and equipment. And uh, okay, so I was like, all right, well, I'll have a look at it. Can I see examples of your previous work? I've heard about it. You've talked about it. I've never seen anything. Can I watch some? Yeah, yeah, no problem, mate. I'll, I'll send you a few, a few links. Weeks go by. Days, weeks go by. Don't hear anything. Hey, Rob, I got an email. The same person. So, are you going to come on board my project or not? <laughs> I, I asked for a track. I, I asked to see examples of your work. You remember I said, oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry, sorry. I'll send that over to you. Oh, it's all on Digibeta and Beta SP now. I got to convert. Blah, 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 blah. Can I see examples of previous work? A few more weeks go by. Hey, Rob, are you going to work? For fuck's sake. <laughs> I want to see you. God did. No, I'm not coming on board. I actually did get that pissed off. <laughs> so yeah, that's how I decide. All right. I think is that everything? I don't know. Are there on more online thingies? My phone died. So, <laughs> <laughs> so those people are shit out of luck. So um. All right, ladies and gentlemen, yay. thank you so much. Everyone can give Rob a round of applause, please. Thank you. So it's a quarter of a As Rob said, um. Oh, Networking yeah. is incredibly important, yeah. so it's great that you guys came out to this event. Rob runs the biggest networking event outside of London, so make sure you check out Sheffield Shops. South Yorkshire Filmmakers Network, yeah. South Yorkshire Filmmakers Network. So SYFN.org. And so you, Sage, the yeah. Yeah, your former member, Jenny. Exactly. Yeah, so, um, so make sure you head down <laughs> to those and... Um, and yeah, um, you'll be around for a little bit just around to answer bit, yeah. any personal questions and sure. Rob's got to shoot off. So, But you do network within each other and we will speak to you all soon. Get around right. a drink. Thank you, everybody. Woo! Cheers now. All right. Okay. Hey, you're right.